So, uh, I think we can start. Uh, my name is Jonathan Brown, I'm a professor here at the uh, Will Lee Control Center for Research and Understanding. We'll close the door in a second. And I've just been informed that Georgetown, not just us, not just this room, but Georgetown has a new policy, which is that if you come into this room, you are waiving your, you are giving permission to be recorded if you ask questions. So if you ask a question before, we'd have to get everybody, anybody whose voice is going to be recorded would have to sign a form, which means we'd cut off the Q&A when we did recordings. Now the Q&A is going to be included in all its glory, which is good because Q&As are usually interesting. It's also bad because then, uh, you know, you can be held responsible for whatever questions. You get sued. Yeah. <laughs> or, I don't know. I mean, who's, has anyone ever been sued for Q&A? We'll have to research that. Either way, it won't be Georgetown now. So that's all right. Uh, this is a, I'm very excited to have uh, our speaker today. Marvin uh, Howe uh, was a longtime reporter at the New York Times. And before that, she attended uh, Rutgers Journalism School and started out as a freelance journalist writing for BBC's Arabic program. And then for the New York Times, she worked for many years uh, in Africa, from South to North, from North Africa to South Africa. And she wrote a book on uh, the Moroccan independence movement called The Prince and I. And she retired from the New York Times in 1995 and since then has, I guess, been pursuing her passion of writing lots of books on an interesting subject. And as I looked down the list of books, these were all things that I was interested in. I probably, and I read through uh, much of the book, the Andalusia book uh, yesterday, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to the other books too. One of them is uh, Turkey, A Nation Divided Over Islam's Revival. That's a pretty straightforward title. I like it. Morocco, Islamist Awakening and Other Challenges, another t book that people interested in the Islamic world would find uh, helpful. And, uh, and this one, Al-Andalus Rediscovered, Iberia's New Muslims. So um, she'll speak for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then we'll have time for question and answer and comments. Please, you're welcome. Go ahead. Well, I know I'm supposed to start out today with a joke, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I must say that the situation in Iberia these days is not really a laughable matter. Uh, most of the news out of Iberia is bad news. Uh, the high unemployment, the recession, uh, the uh, ev evictions, uh, crises in every direction. The only good news coming out of Spain these days is that uh, Spain is still number one in the rankings for FIFA, the World Soccer uh, 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 Championship. Uh, it was another world when I first uh, embarked on this current book that I've just completed, uh, Al Andalus Rediscovered. I'd been in Andalus in Spain and Portugal for uh, many years, but this time I went out specifically to see, to see what was happening because. In 2006-2007, uh, Spain and Portugal were flourishing economies, just that recently, number one destination uh, for immigrants in Europe, and um, very welcoming to the Muslims that were coming. They were coming in pateras from North Africa, the, the little rickety skiffs and, and rubber dinghies, and they were coming from Pakistan and from India and from Africa by plane. They were arriving on uh, uh, little boats, uh, in, and then uh, they arrived with visas that were about three, you'd get three months, but they would overstay and they would fade into the, uh, into the, into the landscape. So. It was such a welcoming place that in 2005, Spain actually uh, uh, welcomed and legalized 700,000 uh, undocumented immigrants. Well, this was a record for Europe. And uh, the two countries understood that they had to develop an immigration policy because they didn't have one. They met in 
a rose-colored building in um, Lisbon <coughs> called the Palava Palace. It's uh, the Spanish embassy there, and it's uh, a wonderful, wonderful building. All the uh, immigrant uh, officials, the people who dealt with immigration in the two countries, met there and devised a policy for immigration as, as recently as 2007. And this policy was supposed, they aimed it to be more humane than the other uh, policies that had been carried out in Northern Europe and the US, but it's mainly in contrast to Northern Europe. And uh, it was called interculturalism. And interculturalism really means an intermingling of uh, different cultures, not side by side, intermingling and basically uh, the same equal rights for both uh, citizens and the newcomers, the, uh, the non-citizens. Uh, they, devi they devised this program based on their own experience and based on other people's experiences. And it was astonishing because in 2007, uh, Spain and uh, Portugal were sort of an island unto themselves. The rest of Europe was mainly kind of a fortress Europe, and they were talking about the rise of Islamism, and, and it was a very, the mood was very anti-Islamic. They had actually uh, had their mass migrations in the 60s when the Northern Europe uh, uh, countries were developing and, and flourishing and needed labor. And they, had, they got a lot of Muslims from their old colonies, uh, most of them, and from the neighboring states. And they, they had uh, devised a program called multiculturalism, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Well, it was declared to be a failure uh, about 2007. And at that time, it was a failure because we were in the post-9-11 age. And at that time, there were uh, there was a rise of right-wing parties in Northern Europe, and uh, every everything uh, was uh, very, very negative uh, against the immigrants. Well, it was amazing that, that the liberal policy should come out of Iberia, which had such a conflicted past. We had Al-Andalus. We had um, a civilization which was, for two and a half centuries, a very positive, enlightened civilization under Muslim occupation. But of course, uh, there were a lot of people who remembered the occupi occupation, the occupying forces, and there were many wars during that time among the Muslim principalities and the Christian Reconquista, of course. Uh, and to jump from that time, they, well, they had the uh, mass expulsions, they got rid of all the Muslims and, and Jews in, 2000, in uh, 1492, as we know. And uh, later, they even uh, the, the Spanish uh, expelled all the Muslim converts, the Moriscos. Uh, and that was as early as the, as late as the 17th century, uh, the early 17th century. And of course, in modern history, we had Madrid, Madrid, the Mer Madrid terrorist attack which was in 2004. You had radical Muslims uh, blowing up five commuter trains. So it was, uh, it was a difficult time for the peninsula, but, but they did it, they handled it fairly well. The reaction of the Spanish and the Portuguese to the uh, terrorist attacks of Madrid, which were the most serious attacks on European soil at that time. There were something like 200 dead and, uh, and 2,000 injured in that attack. Well, the reaction was, was fairly good. Uh, there were no pogroms, there were no uh, mass riots after that, and, and quite surprising. I was interested when I set out on my um, research to find out why. And I talked to Spanish and Portuguese leadership and, and policy makers. And I thought, well, is it because they want to make amends and for, the, for the sins of the past? No, there was no idea of that. It was essentially, everyone told me, 
we are emigrant nations. We've been emigrants until recently. And so they had a special empathy uh, for the immigrants that were coming to the peninsula and uh, they, they wanted to uh, do better than, than other countries had done. And so uh, they devised this Iberian model. And the Iberian model, as I said, was based on interculturalism. It was similar in, in principle. They wanted to integrate their Muslims in the uh, national fabric, but they were very different in structure in the two countries. Portugal had one centralized body called ACIDI, which is the High Commission for uh, Immigration and uh, Intercultural Dialogue. Mm -hmm. And it was an extraordinary uh, institution because it was not a government not, not a government uh, agency like we know the, the immigration services, ICE. It's very different. It was more a, in practice, it was a voice for the immigrants, and it linked immigrants to the different government departments. And it was, it was a working uh, institution. They had a lot of immigrants. They employed a lot of immigrants. They had contacts with immigrant uh, NGOs, and there was a great uh, understanding there, trying to help immigrants legalize themselves, giving them legal help, <coughs> helping them uh, find jobs, and all this seemed to be working quite well. In Spain, uh, it was very different because Spain is so decentralized. You had uh, most of the uh, immigration policy was under the Ministry of Labor, and they set, even set up a, uh, they drafted a plan, a strategic plan for the uh, in immigration and citizenship of uh, immigrants. And so this was uh, a very advanced plan that they put into uh, function through the Ministry of Labor. The Ministry of Justice also handled uh, uh, immigrants and uh, non-Muslims uh, non and Muslims. They, they were dealing mainly with uh, the Latin Americans, because there were a lot of Latin American immigrants uh, under this program, but they were also dealing with the Muslims. They had, uh, they set up a foundation for pluralism, and this foundation had uh, funds to help integrate the different uh, religious communities, the three main religions, uh, Christianity, Protestantism, of course, as a minority in this Roman Catholic uh, area. And um, they also had uh, language courses, uh, teaching Castellano to the immigrants, teaching Arabic to uh, immigrant children of the Muslims. And uh, also they uh, helped with setting up internet programs. It was, it was a very interesting organization. Well, all these, um, the, these institutions worked quite well uh, uh, in the beginning. Of course, they weren't perfect, and the situation wasn't perfect. You did have um, radicalism in both countries, because we're talking about the post-9-11 age. And in, even in Portugal, which has been uh, received c compliments and praise from northern Europeans, over its, uh, its very open uh, attitude towards uh, religions, different faiths, and towards uh, immigrants. Even there, there were some so beginnings of suspicion towards the Muslim population. Muslims that I talked to in Portugal said uh, that they, before 9-11, they had not felt that uh, any difference with the rest of the population, but afterwards, they would go on, if they wore headscarves, they would be uh, looked at askance in Portugal. The, one of the most serious incidents that occurred in this post-9-11 uh, age uh, in Portugal was the Cardinal Patriarch as actually came out and said Muslims, that Christians should not marry Muslims. Well, this caused a furor in the Portuguese press and the church did not 
uh, back down on that, but it showed that there was an underlying um, suspicion of, of, uh, of Muslim integration, even in Portugal. In Spain, the situation was different and more serious. You'd in the beginning, I think the first um, anti-Muslim riots were in 2000, so before 2001. These were, this was El Ejido, and it was uh, termed in the Spanish press as being an, quote, orgy of radical um, intolerance towards, uh, uh, towards the Muslim community. It started out with two faits divers, uh, ordinary events, ordinary bad criminal events, but, but what, what would happen in any country. Uh, a Palestinian killed two farmers, two Spanish farmers, and, uh, and about a week later you had a deranged, mentally deranged uh, Moroccan who killed uh, another, te a teenager. And so after that you had this mass riot in um, Ejido, which is near Almeria on the uh, eastern side, eastern coast mm -hmm. of Spain. But the important thing to say about El Ejido is that it was a lesson and the Spanish have not had to suffer race riots since then. Uh, you did have incidents in Catalonia uh, in 2010. You had uh, criminal events. You had scuffles between Muslims and Christians over just parking places, things like that, that would degenerate into uh, what looked like incipient uh, race problems. But usually the community, the Muslim community and the Spanish government would handle things fairly well and uh, nothing, uh, nothing developed that was uh, really serious. The uh, there were still difficulties in Catalonia, which is heavily immigrant, uh, has a he heavily immigrant population, and is also influenced by the situation in France. And uh, the mosques, uh, when the Muslims tried to set up mosques in Catalonia, th there were protests from the neighbors, and they said, you, we don't want all those people coming on Friday and praying and making all that noise. And they also, uh, had problems with the street prayer. Since they didn't have enough prayer halls and enough mosques, a lot of the Muslims uh, gave prayers in the, in the streets. And they had problems because uh, the community said, no, this uh, disrupts traffic and so on. And they tried to relegate the new prayer halls to industrial areas. And that was a difficult problem because Spain was uh, had these more serious problems because they had so many more uh, Muslims than, than the Portuguese did. The Portuguese opened prayer halls and opened mosques and no problem, no, no one ever objected to it. Uh, you also had radicals on the other side on the, among the Muslims. Uh, in Spain you had uh, a number of imams, most of them, according to my Muslim friends, were not well educated and they took very radical positions uh, publicly. So, some of them actually uh, uh, said that uh, one of them in, in Andalusia, for example, said, oh, a Muslim has, uh, is allowed to beat his wife. Well, that caused a furor in the general Muslim communi community. They rejected that. And then in, in the north, in Catalonia, there was a, an imam who was quite celebrated, and he uh, refused to shake hands with, uh, other, with women, and he refused to work with a Muslim woman who, uh, who, would, who didn't want to wear a headscarf. And uh, there were other incidents like this, the community actually dealt with, the Muslim community dealt with these incidents quite uh, quietly and sort of escorted them out of the country and sent one imam to Saudi Arabia. The government's uh, policy was also very wise. They set up a course 
for imams and were teaching the imams Spanish law so that they would know how to get along in, in the uh, uh, Spanish uh, c context. And that worked quite well. So basically, the uh, interculturalism was working until the economy sa soured. And then at that point, uh, uh, the Pateras were still coming, the, the boat people, and Europe, northern Europe, we, we, in Iberia we call northern Europe, Europe. Uh, the, uh, the northern Europeans started putting pressure on, uh, on the uh, Spanish and Portuguese governments to do something about their frontiers, take control of their frontiers. And uh, they did, they acceded, they participated in uh, Frontex, which is a kind of a border patrol of the uh, Mediterranean and the Atlantic, and, and they were preventing, trying to prevent these uh, boat people from reaching the uh, mainland. They also uh, worked and announced that they would have no more mass am amnesties because, of course, Northern Europe said, who, who arrives in Europe without frontiers in uh, Iberia will make their ways up to Germany and France, and so they didn't want that. So they said no more mass amnesties. And then the economy got worse, and it was a crash, a, a real crash. Uh, bubble, the bubble, housing bubble burst in Spain, and uh, unemployment was uh, disastrous, something like 26% uh, unemployment in Spain, 16% in Portugal. And they held elections. Well, of course, the, the population charged the socialist governments in the two countries uh, with mismanagement, economic mismanagement, and ousted them. And they brought in conservative governments in both countries. And the two uh, countries continued to uphold the principle of interculturalism. And uh, they kept the basic structure of, uh, the, immigra of the immigrant reception and all that. A CD is still there. It's still headed by the same person in Portugal. And uh, the conservative government said that they had done a good job and wanted to continue their policies. In Spain, they kept the, uh, they eliminated the plan for uh, citizenship, but it, they just didn't have the funds. And they, uh, but they did keep the uh, foundation for pluralism which is still working on uh, integrating the Muslim communities and the Jewish community, which is very tiny, and, they, uh, uh, and the Protestants. And the foundation has, uh, its funds have been cut by at least half, but they are doing a, a fairly good job of it. They're continuing to do classes, and they have classes for women to integrate into the society. Uh, well, the immigrants helped no end, because most of them stayed away. I mean, nowadays, they're not coming. The North Africans are not coming. The Sub-Saharan Africans, there's still an occasional patera which arrives, and, but very, very few compared to the heydays in 2006. Um, they, uh, we don't have figures on how many Muslims have left the country, but we do know that uh, in 2012 you had something like 22,000 Moroccans who left, and you had 7,000 Bangladeshis alone who left Portugal. Well, that's quite a few in that small country, uh, but most of them stayed. And in my opinion, that is a kind of a testimony to uh, the success of interculturalism, because even though the countries are in dire straits, most of them stayed. And there were people like uh, a friend of mine in Portugal, uh, Dr. Ayad, who is of Mozambique origin. He's uh, a businessman. His wife is a medical surgeon, and he has two sons. They have uh, uh, businesses in Portugal. The businesses went down, and like all other Portuguese, all other, many other Portuguese businesses went down. And of course, he had come from as a, 
uh, were tornado, which is uh, an immigrant from the Portuguese colonies. And he and many of the Portuguese non-Muslims lo are looking to their old colonies uh, for new opportunities. And he has sent his wife and his sons to Mozambique, where the economy is uh, picking up and it's uh, got a good democratic regime almost, and it's doing very well. So they're sending their um, families to open up new businesses, but they're staying in Portugal because uh, many of the Muslims I talk to say, we like to raise our children here in Portugal. It's uh, safer than most people and Muslims feel at home. In Spain, uh, you had people like uh, my friend Said Kirlani, who is uh, a young man from Morocco. He was head of the uh, Moroccan Students Association in the Madrid Autonomous University. And he was uh, uh, very integrated in the Spanish society. Uh, he actually worked at the same time that he was doing his PhD, worked in the municipals uh, program for uh, it was called Open Door, Open Language. It was a program by the Madrid municipal municipality to uh, teach Spanish immigrants, uh, their, to teach their children Spanish, uh, to, to teach um, Muslim immigrants uh, Spanish. And so he um, told me last, last year, I was there last summer, and he said he was kind of worried that his program was going to be cut down. Uh, because of the, the budget cuts. But I got an email from him recently, who sa and it, it, he said that he was happy he could stay on, finish his PhD, because he'd gotten a job in the Casa Arabi, which was expanding uh, its uh, programs in Arabic. And um, the Casa Arabi is a, a tool uh, of the government, of the Madrid government, which uh, is its main function in the beginning was to sort of uh, familiarize uh, the uh, local population with what was happening out in the Arab world. And they had uh, very prominent Arab visitors. And uh, now it's a bit different. They've changed. Their, uh, they still have as many programs as they used to have. But it's uh, to develop the uh, Muslim and uh, Spanish relations through culture and uh, languages. And they have many uh, programs today, and that's continuing. Uh, there was another uh, couple that I'd like to mention. Uh, there was a woman named Laila Ratib, Ratab. She's, from, uh, she's a Spanish-born Muslim. She wears a headscarf. I met her when she was a communication student uh, a couple of years ago in uh, a, a university in Madrid. And she said she'd had no problems in the university life that completely accepted, but she had heard that women wearing headscarves in the Spanish public were having troubles finding jobs. And she wasn't quite sure what she would be able to do later. Well, last year I saw her and her husband. They are both working, he's a Moroccan, they are both working for a new institution in Spain, which is Cordoba TV. And it's a satellite TV station, which was set up a year ago. And basically, the purpose was to talk about Spanish um, uh, Islam. And uh, it's broadcast mainly in uh, all over Spain, of course, but also in Latin America. And so the Spanish uh, uh, Islam is getting a voice. It's interesting that at this time, when you have so many uh, Muslims leaving the country, you have them, they, they, they have a much more uh, visible uh, presence. And you've got mosques deliberately opening their doors to the wider uh, uh, community, to the non-Muslim community, so that they can have programs together and understand each other better. You've got a new group set up by uh, a friend of mine, Amparo, uh, Sanchez, uh, who is, she's vice president of the Islamic community of Spain, and she's a convert to Islam and has set up a new uh, 
group called the Plataforma for um, uh, Islamic uh, Understanding and Civilization and, uh, and Citizenship. And uh, that is beginning to get the Muslims themselves uh, on board to fight against uh, the growing Islamophobia. Uh, you also have a, a group of converts who have set up a Congress of uh, Islamic Feminism, and they hold their uh, meetings every year. And it's an international group, and you have Muslim feminists coming to uh, Spain to uh, work out their problems and see what they can do about it. I think that one of the most telling experiences I had was last summer. I had heard that there was going to be a Muslim uh, pop concert in Madrid, and I thought that would be interesting because two years earlier there had been a big sensation when a teenager, a Muslim teenager, had worn a headscarf in a state school, and that caused a furor all over the country. Well, here they were going to have a Muslim pop concert. It was. It was sponsored by um, the Muslim youth organization of Hetafi. The Hetafi is a working class suburb of Madrid. And also the, uh, uh, the Spanish branch of the Muslim charities in, in Britain. And they invited a Lebanese singer, uh, very popular internationally, Maher Zain, and he came. Well, it was held in the Garcia Lor Lorca Theater in uh, Hatafi, and uh, there was the house was full. There were hundreds of people. I know that it was more than 800 because that's the capacity. And uh, most of the audience were teenagers. Uh, most of them wearing headscarves. There were some, a sprinkling of Span Spaniards. The enthusiasm. I, I had not seen so much enthusiasm in a Muslim community in Spain. It was incredible. Uh, the, uh, the singer knew how to work the crowd. He got up there and said, ah, welcome to my brothers and sisters from Palestine, from um, Morocco, from Algeria, from Madrid, from Barcelona. And he sang of peace and love in Arabic and English. Well, the house exploded. And the climax of that particular uh, show was when a small boy came up on the theater stage and with a Syrian flag and handed it to the um, singer and the singer draped it over his shoulders and said uh, I'm not political but uh, this is uh, there are babies dying in, in Syria and so this song is for freedom well, there was all pandemonium, everybody enthusiastic. He sang a song for freedom, and then the concert uh, ended. Well, uh, one of the organizers got up at the end and said, uh, just to avoid any kind of uh, disturbances, please uh, exit the theater in little groups. Here you had all these headscarves, you know, <laughs> women with headscarves, excited enthusiastic. Everybody filed out easily, mingled with the crowd outside. There was a late night, but in Spain, you know, l nights are late. And this crowd was waiting for a s traditional Spanish uh, parade, which is uh, fallas, which are these giant paper mache heads. Uh, and all these people, the Muslims, came out of the theater, entered into the crowd, blended in completely. There was not one incident. The press said nothing about the whole thing. There were no right-wing blogs. And in my opinion, this was uh, a successful example of, multi of this uh, interculturalism. And I talked to a uh, Moroccan friend of mine and asked him uh, what, what did he think it was. And he said it's normalization. That Spanish Islam is, be, is, is becoming normalized 400 years after they were all e expelled. And so uh, 
just to remind you that today we have something like two million Muslims in Spain. Uh, that's including probably uh, un a number of undocumented. They're not too many, 200,000, I'm told. And we also have uh, something like 40,000 Muslims in Portugal. Well, I, I believe, in answer to my own question, I believe that uh, interculturalism is working. I think it has a good chance to work. I'm not a, a prophet, but from what I can see, the uh, Iberian Islam is there to stay. Thank you very much.